The Malman line got its name from General Malman, who thought of it. Not much was done about it till the 20th of June, when American troops advanced between Limoa Wood and Preto San Susan. General von Choltitz hurriedly improvised the defences. There was a depth to the defences, but the main line of defence on the 2nd of July stretched from Bretteville sur A along the Mont Garden Ridge, round the north of the A du Puy, along the Pottery Ridge to gorge flooded marshes east of Plessis Lastel. Hitler didn't like the idea of several lines of defences. He thought it encouraged the men to retreat. At the start of July, the front line stretched from Port Bay to Comont Levante. It was held by the 8th, 7th, 19th and the 5th Corps. The rapid advance of the 8th Corps, commanded by General Middleton, would destabilise the German resistance. The objective was to take the high ground near Coutances. But Pass La Dupuis was a bottleneck at the level of Lesse between the muddy A estuary and the Gorge marshes. After the success of taking Cherbourg, the Americans felt the German troops were losing morale, which led them to be optimistic on the outcome of the pending operation. Eisenhower promised all the support General Middleton needed for his 8th Corps, so he asked for bombing of fuel dumps and troops behind and on the resistance line. 8th Corps was made up of the 79th, 82nd and the 90th Divisions. <music> 8th Corps was about to come up against the Malman Line, but they didn't know it existed. They got information in a particular way. A German officer was taken prisoner, and in his belongings they found a photo of him nude surrounded by prostitutes. They threatened to have the photo sent to his wife. He told them all he knew. Light rain was falling as the attack started on the 3rd of July. It then became a downpour. The air support had to be cancelled. Even the Piper Cub spotters were grounded. Artillery started a quarter hour bombardment. His 79th Division had landed on Utah Beach on the 12th of June. They took a decisive part in the capture of Cherbourg and were now deployed along the west coast of Cherbourg Peninsula. They were to take Coutances, but before that they had to clear the way through La Haye du Puy. La Haye du Puy was a crossroad town surrounded by hills. Mont Garden was a hill 84 metres high, overlooked La Haye du Puy from the west. General Wick wanted to get point 84. The 3rd July, a 315th Regiment of Colonel McMahon advanced along the coast. They were suddenly surprised by two German tanks that passed by and started firing. Several tanks being knocked out and then panicked and started running back. But the artillery and anti-tank guns soon restored order. The 79th had to cross 8 kilometres of lowland, marshes and hedgerows defended by the remnants of the 243rd Division and the 353rd Division, dug in on the summit. General Wick wanted to get Mont Deauville first, that's Hill 121. The 314th Regiment, led by Colonel Robinson, advanced each side of the road from Port Bay to La Haye du Puy. This is the road from Port Bay to La Haye du Puy, and in the distance is the Mont Deauville. The 314th Regiment, was trying to outflank Mondeauville and then to take it. They were coming down each side of the main road. They came under fire from a machine gun on this railway embankment. The railway line used to be here. The private first class Thurston charged the machine gun and eliminated it. That allowed the advance to continue. He got the DSC for exaction. Twelve men led the regiment as pathfinders. General Wick lost radio contact. At 2300 hours, he sent the order to stop, but had no reply. The 314th continued their advance, and the evening was coming on, so Colonel Wick sent the order to stop. But they didn't get it, and the next he heard, it wasn't until 0230 on the 4th, that he got a message to say they were on the top of the Mont Deauville. Colonel Robinson immediately sent his reserve battalion to reinforce them. Mont Deauville had a stone building from the Middle Ages. 
there are also some defences made with sandbag. Now from the top of Mont Deauville, we get one of the best views of the Malmen line. Over there is uh, Mont Etecla, and then further around is Mont Castre, just here on the skyline. And over this way is Mont Garden Ridge. And even further around, we can see the sea, the English Channel still. The 4th of July, at dawn, the 314th cleared the few German defences on Mont Deauville. Junction was made with the 82nd on their left during the morning. Entry into Le Dupuis was stopped by incessant artillery fire. The men dug in and the artillery carried out a duel. A German artillery observer was up one of the church towers. That was taken out. The observer's body was found in the market square. The spire was never rebuilt. By the evening of the 4th, the 315th were three kilometres from the summit of Mont Garden and in spite of being attacked by panzers, they achieved the north slope of Mont Garden by the 5th. The 82nd Airborne had landed at 0230 on the 6th. They'd taken some Eriglis and two British on the Mer d'Arrée. On the 12th of June, they'd crossed the defended marshes. Now in this operation, they were given a limited mission because they were about to go back to England to prepare for Market Garden. Now since the D-Day, half of the men had become casualties. The 82nd were to take Mont Etonclin, or Etonclin Wood, which is that hill there, and the Potier Ridge, which is the other side, towards Montcast. Guided by a Frenchman, the company of the 505th, led by Lieutenant Colonel Ekman, went along the marshes, which is over there, they wanted to outflank the resistance of the Germans at the bottom of the hill and they found themselves right in the middle of a group of German soldiers, in fact they were Osttruppen, who retreated rapidly. By midday the main body of the 505th had arrived and they'd occupied the north and east slopes of uh, Mont Etonclin. They'd also got up to the road from saint sauveur which is the other side. That was the limit between the 82nd and the 79th Division. Colonel Inquist, leading the 508th, took the southeastern slopes of Etonclan Wood. The lead elements of the 507th advanced so rapidly that they passed some German troops before they realised there was an attack on. By midday, the regiment had dug in at its objective. For the 325th Glider Regiment, on the left, it was a different scenario. After a slow start, caused by mines, they advanced rapidly for two kilometres, then one of the support tanks was hit by a mine. Three others were bogged down in mud. There was incessant fire coming from Mont Castre. They were to cross three summits and were coming under fire from the Germans on Mont Castre. Whereas the parachute regiments had come up against the forward guard, the glider men had hit the main line of defence. Early on the 4th, Ridgeway ordered the glider commander to attack just the eastern summit of the three and the 507th and 508th would attack the other two summits from the north. The 505th would work down the road which was the division limit with the 79th division. From the slopes of Mont Cass we can see the three summit of the Pottery Ridge. The artillery barrage stopped a bit too soon and many advancing men were cut down. Private Delury of the 508th met Private Porcella. They thought they were the only survivors, but soon met up with others. They were pinned down by enemy artillery for the rest of the day. Ridgeway telephones to Lieutenant Colonel Mendes to continue the attack. He had just been helping a man when the man's head had been blown off. He replied to Ridgeway that he should come in person and give the order. Ridgeway said, you're a West Point officer, do your duty. The advance continued. Some men teamed up with some tank destroyers. Part of Hill 95 was taken, then they had to retreat, but during the night the ridge was retaken. By midday on the 5th, the German troops on the Pottery Ridge had retreated. On the 6th, the 82nd held off more opposition, and by the 7th, all resistance was eliminated. The 82nd was waiting to be relieved by the 8th Division. The 90th Division landed on Utah Beach on the 7th of June. 
Their artillery had cleared the way for the 82nd crossing the causeway at Chef du Pont. They had had problems advancing since they landed. General Londrum had replaced General McKelvey because the 90th weren't advancing as expected. This is Montcastre, which was one of the keys to the Malmon line. It was taken by the 90th Division after over a week of bloody combats. The 90th had to attack Montcastre from a narrow strip between the marshes to the east. The division moved off at 5.30 after a quarter of an hour artillery barrage. 359th Regiment was held up at Preto saint suzanne By the evening, they had held the high ground north of Preto. The 357th advanced towards its objective, south of the railway line, southeast of saint jean They were held up at the railway line. The battalion of the 358th advanced cautiously towards Sablon. The hamlet has half a dozen houses in a shady hollow. Patrols reported strong German presence there in the preceding days. A German machine gun knocked out the communications post. The commanders had no communications during the day. Colonel Partridge made the infantry retreat so he could use the artillery. By midday they retook the village. But ten minutes later, a few German track vehicles turned up and the infantry fled. Partridge realised it was one self-propelled gun and two half-tracks stopping in advance. The engineers being in the village meant no artillery could be called on. By late afternoon, the engineers pulled back and Partridge organised his tanks and artillery to clear the way. The regiment went through Sablon in evening. Partridge wanted to continue, but the Germans were still shelling and Landrum felt they'd moved enough. By the end of the 3rd, the 90th had moved on average 1,200 yards, with a loss of 600 casualties. Throughout the night, the artillery from Montcastre rained down on them. During the 4th, the 359th advanced towards its objective of the eastern nose of Montcastre. They were repulsed by a combined panzer and infantry attack, but in the afternoon the pressure diminished and by the evening they had control of saint yor Litter Road. The advance had been difficult, but by sundown they had accelerated and advanced three kilometres. Captain Leroy Pons and Private Brosser were instrumental in leading this advance. This advance was no doubt aided by the 82nd taking the Pottery Ridge that left the left flank of the Germans exposed. The 358th continued their advance and took Belcroix and La Butte. This was led by Captain Philip Carroll, who was wounded in the eye. He received the DSC for his action. It was nearly midnight when they stopped. The 357th had moved into the gap between the other two regiments. Sergeant Anderson of the 712th Armour was in a priest, 105mm self-propelled gun. The priest behind was hit by a tank on their left. The tank fired at them and hit the ground, then knocked off their track. The priest fired back and missed, then dropped the barrel to the maximum and got the shell just under the tank's gun. Four of the crew bailed out. The driver was still in it. Anderson walked over to inspect. The driver was dead in his seat. There was a shell in the breech. If they'd had time to fire, it would have taken their priest out. Their advance had cost more than the 600 casualties of the first day. OKW finally allowed the 15th German Parachute Regiment to be released. The advance towards Beaucourdre in the corridor between marshes was still blocked. The Germans had excellent viewpoints from Montcastre. On the 5th, the rain had stopped allowing air support to take action. The 357th got to 500 yards of Beaucoudre, but Colonel Partridge couldn't get enough men in the narrow corridor between the floods and Montcastre. By 1600 hours, the 1st Battalion 358, which had been supporting the 357th, was sent to back up the 359th, which was attacking the northeastern slopes of Montcastre. By sundown, the 90th had advanced 2,000 yards and had a foothold on the slopes of Montcastre. The 313th had advanced on the right hand of the 315th to attack Montgarden Hill but was stopped by well-entrenched defences. To 
consolidate the success of the 315th on the previous day, the 314th swept right to help take point 84. Mont Garden Ridge was finally taken. On the 7th of July, Le Dupuis had been bypassed by the 79th to be levelled with the 90th on their left. General Wick thought that the Germans in the town, being more or less surrounded, would capitulate and he then could continue towards the River A, but soon realised that this wasn't going to happen. He sent a patrol into the town with a German prisoner to persuade the Germans to surrender. They didn't even get past the first houses. The troops holding the town no doubt knew what was going to happen very soon. 4,000 troops and artillery of the Das Reich were arriving from the Khan region. On the 8th, the 2nd SS, that's the Das Reich, they attacked up onto Mont Garden Ridge. The shock of the first armoured attack nearly forces 79th from the crest. General Wick put both battalions under one commander. The coordinated defences managed to repulse the Das Reich. And by then, they had practically been taken. You see, we're just less than a mile from Les Dupuis. Les Dupuis was then subjected to bombardment from the air plus artillery. The German troops in Les Dupuis suffered 90% casualties. By the 8th, Captain Pillman, who has commanded the Germans in Les Dupuis, had gone missing. There was only about 40 Germans still in town. A battalion of the 79th was held up by a minefield and machine gun fire. In spite of heavy losses, they infiltrated the town. Houses continued to burn throughout the night. On the night they went through the town, house to house, clearing out the remnants of the German resistance. La Dupuis was taken. The 79th had incurred nearly 2,000 casualties in nine days of fighting. Half of those on the 8th. On the 6th, the 82nd faced some stiff opposition north of La Dupuis. The 82nd was waiting to be relieved by the 8th Division. By the 7th, all pockets of resistance were eliminated and the 82nd had completed its mission. This is the top of Mont Castre, it's covered in woods. There's some pastures, like over this way. And the farm of Mont Castre is over there. But it's private property, can't go there. But from the top of Mont Castre, you can see right to Utah Beach. That's the advantage the Germans had with these hills. On the 5th, the rain had stopped, allowing air support to take action. By sundown, the division had moved 200 yards. Colonel Partridge's 357th got to 500 yards of Beaucourtre but was cramped in the corridor south of saint Yor. But the 359th was on the northeastern slope of Mont Castre. The Fales sent a battalion of the 359th to attack the north slope and two battalions of the 359th and the 358th to attack the northeastern slope, which is that way and by the nightfall on the 4th of July they were at the farm in Montcastre which is just over there. Their lines were so thinly spread that during the night the German patrol crossed their lines and attacked some supply chains. It was very difficult getting supplies in and the wounded went out. In the evening of the 6th the rain started again. Jim Flowers took his tank up to get essential supplies to the men. On the way up his tank knocked out the German tank before it could fire. Around midnight on the 6th, the 357th suffered an attack from the 15th Parachute Regiment. Some companies pulled back and I and L companies were left surrounded on the high ground. The medieval tower which overlooked them was connected by telephone to Mont Cast. Shells rained down on them. Colonel Barth of the 357th sent a company supported by tanks to relieve the isolated men south of Beaucoudre. They were attacked on their right flank. A runner came from the isolated men and told them that most had been killed. Private Lujan in Beaucoudre was hit by a sniper. The bullet went through his left cheek and out under his right ear. 
His squad took him to a house and left him there. But then the Germans burst in. The house had been used as a German aid station. He was there for five days till an ambulance took him to a POW camp in Rennes. The men near Montcast farm were pushed back onto the northern slope. German troops were now between the 1st and the 3rd battalions of the 359th. The 1st battalion was ordered to retake their position around Montcastre Farm. They were pushed back twice and by midnight were just short of their objective. Troops at La Ville held firm. Enemy troop movements were observed at Veli and Mobec. Concentrated artillery fire held off fire of attacks. The 8th Division had taken over from the 82nd and were to relieve the 90th men in the forest on Montcastre. Some captured German officers informed them that the Das Reich were preparing to attack from the southwest. The German defence along the 8th and the 7th Corps was as strong as ever. Colonel Barth, with the 357th, entered the corridor between Montcastre and the marshes. The medieval tower at Plessis Lastel was connected to Montcastre's artillery. A rain of shells came down on them. The corridor was too narrow to engage in more troops. The troops tried to shelter in the hedges. The German 15th Paras had moved to La Haye du Puy. The 2nd SS was ready to move. The defences on Montcastre were menaced by the 357th at Beaucoudre. The Germans had to eliminate this threat. Artillery rained down on the men around Beaucoudre. After five days of combat, they had advanced five kilometres at a cost of 2,000 casualties. The German 15th Paras had moved to La Haye du Puy. The 2nd SS was ready to move. After five days of combat, they had advanced five kilometres with a cost of 2,000 casualties. On the 8th and the 9th, the 90th held their positions against repeated attacks. The survivors of INL Company returned to the north of Bocoudre. As of the 10th of July, just the 90th still had to obtain its objective, with the 8th Division backing them up. Intelligence came from the corps level, but the Germans were retreating. The 357th attacked to take the road from Bocoudre towards Montcast, but the Germans were still there holding on ferociously. They finally pulled back to the stream, 300 yards north. The 359th held the positions as the 8th Division continued to pass through, then continued the attack. The 358th got to and held the southeast point of Montcast, overlooking the road to Plessis Lastel. The 358th was backed up by the tanks from the 712th Tank Battalion. Jim Flowers led another four tanks to relieve Colonel Jack Beagle and his men, surrounded on the southern tip of Montcast. Once they'd arrived, they had a plan of leading the men out by crushing the undergrowth, which imprisoned the infantry. Jim Flowers' tank had an armour-piercing shell come through, which took off part of his right foot. He managed to reach down into the tank to pull his gunner out. With the gunner and another man, they laid in no man's land all night. A German patrol came past and ignored them, except the last man who was a medic. He treated their wounds. In the morning, some Germans set up in the field next to them. A spotter plane came over, and shortly afterwards the shells came in. Flowers lost part of his left leg to an American shell. Rothschild went off to get help, and he sent men back to get flowers. The aggressive action of the 358th had practically broken the resistance of the German troops. 24 hours later, they would retreat along the whole division front. On the 11th, the 358th and 359th came down to capture Beaucoudre and Lestel. During the morning of the 12th, the Bosch retreated three kilometres. The 357th moved along the edge of the floods and the 359th advanced to near the La Bagotterie. The 8th Division was abreast of them, to the right, and on the right of the 8th was the 79th Division. The Manwin line had been broken at a cost to the 90th Division of 5,000 casualties. They had proven their combat effectiveness in spite of being drained of officers and NCOs. The weather had had a great effect on the action. 
It wasn't until the third day that air support could help out. Even the Piper Cub spotter planes couldn't fly. The 82nd had left Normandy to be replaced by the untried 8th Division. Both the 79th and the 90th were fatigued and 40% of them were now replacements. But the Germans couldn't hope for any respite. The 7th Corps was about to go into action towards Saint-Lô. 